everyone. Welcome to my channel, RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous, and I review old-school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week, I'm taking the Wayback Machine to 1981 with a fun retrospective look at the Tom Mulvey Dave Cook editions of the basic and expert sets of Dungeons and & Dragons. This will actually be a two-part video with part one going over the Maldvay Basic Rulebook and part two, the Dave Cook Expert Set, which were simultaneously released in January of 1981. Over the years, I've mentioned these releases many times in my videos and many of the most popular OSR games such as Labyrinth Lord, Lamentations of the Flame Princess, Basic Fantasy and Old School Essentials are all based on this rule set. Back in 2014, I did a comprehensive three-part historical overview on all the editions of Basic Dungeons & Dragons through to the Rules Cyclopedia. That series is one of the most popular on the channel, so you might want to check it out if you haven't already. This video will look at the Maldvay Cook editions in more detail and try to uncover why this edition specifically is held in such high regard. At the end of part two, I'm going to tell you how to get your own print-on-demand copy of these books very inexpensively. Before we begin, I have a few quick channel announcements. First, the podcast with the Dungeon Masters Dojo in which I was a guest speaker went great and was a lot of fun and should be posted on their webpage shortly and in Spotify after the release of this video. Also, Ergon Games is giving away one of their excellent battle mats. Hop on over to their Facebook page and leave a message and mention me, Captain Courageous, and you will be entered into a contest to win one of these beauties. A quick note, only US and UK contestants are accepted as they only ship to those two countries. Finally, I'd like to kindly ask that if you enjoy this content to please subscribe, give this a like, comment, and share, and consider becoming a Patreon. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through my PayPal tip jar. A link is in the description. Alright, let's just dive right in. Simultaneously released in January 1981, this edition of Basic and Expert D&D is a follow-up reorganization of the rules from Home's Basic D&D, released in 1977, which in turn was itself a reorganization from the original Little Brown Booklet edition of Dungeons & Dragons. The exact reason as to why TSR felt the need to produce two distinct parallel versions of the game, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons and Basic D&D, is mired in history, and the reasons vary depending on who you talk to. What is true, though, is that Advanced D&D was considered a completely different game and TSR was not paying royalties to Dave Arneson, the game's co-creator, but did so with D&D Basic. Once again, I covered this in more detail in my Basic D&D review back in 2014. What is also true is that the Holmes Basic Edition of D&D was a big seller for TSR and Gygax and others at TSR felt that a continuation of that game was needed to keep attracting a certain demographic, specifically junior high, middle school, and high school aged players. AD&D's demographic tended to skew older. While the Home's Basic Edition had been a major improvement in organization of the D&D game's rules presentation, it was really just a continuation of the original Little Brown Booklet rules. Maldvay expanded upon and cleaned that up even more, adding in additional rules and details that would make the D&D game distinctly different from its AD&D counterpart, and in many ways some consider superior. The Maldvay basic rules are presented in eight parts. Part one is the introduction, and here is a list of standard D&D terms and a brief overview of what a role-playing game is, is presented. Note that the idea of the caller is still highly suggested. Essentially, the caller was a player that told the DM what the group was going to do after supposedly a consultation with the rest of the group. 
I know in the early days of playing, we tried to stick to that, but it fell out of favor very quickly. However, the introduction does a fine job of explaining the core concepts of the game, experience points, use of the word level, what a monster is, and such concepts as winning that doesn't really apply in the D&D game. Part 2 jumps right into an explanation of the character creation process, and here we can see an immediate departure from Home's Basic, as every ability score is given some relevant modifier. This is another departure from Advanced D&D, which itself gives every ability score a relevant modifier, but Basic D&D starts at 13, while AD&D starts at 15. The modifiers are pretty standardized. 13 to 15 is a plus 1, 16 to 17 is a plus 2, and an 18 results in a plus 3. With strength, for example, the modifier is 4 to hit and damage, with melee weapons and opening doors. And with constitution, that modifier applies to hit points. Like Holmes, Basic D&D only provides information for character progression to level 3, but now Dwarves, Halflings, and Elves have been simplified, and Maldvay introduces the concept of race-based classes, and the classes of Fighter, Cleric, Magic User, and Thief are exclusive to humans. To many, this change was the biggest barrier to playing this version of the game, and many instead opting to play AD&D, which allowed for greater character customization. In the latter half of the 1980s, after the introduction of the third revision of these roles with Frank Menser's basic revision in 1983, Bruce Hurd would address much of these concerns with the outstanding Gazetteer series. Character alignment is also simplified to the law, neutrality, and chaos dynamic, which is a deviation from Holmes, which had five lawful good, lawful evil, chaotic good, and chaotic evil, and neutrality and AD&D, which expanded alignments out to nine different types. After that, equipment list follows, as well as a filled-out character sheet example. Part 3 is just a list of the clerical and magic user spells available in the game. Part 4 is the adventure, which outlines to the players what exactly one might expect while playing the game. Concepts such as using miniature figures and movement are discussed as well, as encumbrance. The use of coins as a measure of weight as opposed to pounds is used with 10 coins essentially equaling one pound of weight, though two systems for representing encumbrance are discussed. A more simplistic system based on the type of armor worn is suggested. Note that in either case a character's strength has no bearing. This is a pretty comprehensive section with rules and discussions on light, doors, retainers, traps, wandering monsters, the parceling out of experience points, and so on. Part 5 is the encounter, and this is the section that deals with the rules on combat. The order of events, rolling initiative, is all presented here. This is also the section in which Maldve introduces the concept of morale checks for monsters. In the next part, Part 6, Monsters, each creature is given a morale score. The game is simple. Roll 2d6, and if the total is higher than the creature's morale score, the creature's fight has gone out of them, and they will likely attempt to flee from the combat if able, or even surrender. This is a very simple and very elegant system to model not just the behavior of monsters in the game, but also any retainers the player characters might have, thus making charisma a lot more important because of a character's charisma's effect on the morale of the retainers. Time is taken to give extensive guidelines for when to check for morale as well, and in comparison to AD&D's weighty and obtrusive rules, which I personally never used, I know I absolutely use morale rules for Maldve, as each creature had a statistic for it, thus making it easy to remember to do. It's also important to mention that checking for morale is mentioned in the list of things to do during a round. Of all the system variances between AD&D and D&D, to me, this one is the most significant as it very much could determine the end result of many encounters. Intelligent creatures very rarely fought to the death, choosing instead to run away or surrender or surprisingly, unexpectedly, staying in to fight to the death. As a DM, I kind of like this unpredictability 
As I've said many times, I don't always want to know what happens next. I like to be surprised as much as the players. This keeps me on my toes, but also keeps me as invested in discovering what happens next as the players are. What are your thoughts on the use of morale in the game? Please share your experiences in the comments section. Part 6, as stated already, is on monsters. The introduction in this section does a great job of discussing what the various monster statistics mean with a lengthy explanation on hit dice. One of the more obscure rules can be found in this section, which is the addition of an asterisk after the hit dice of the creatures. This is for the addition of the special abilities bonus for experience points. Two asterisks indicate that the bonus should be added twice. While this was retained in the Menser edition of the game, Menser simplified the entire affair by simply including the monster's XP value in the creature statistics. Part 7 is about treasure, random placement of such, its XP value, and a healthy list of the goodies that intrepid dungeon explorers might uncover within the depths of some ancient tomb or labyrinth. Everything from poisonous to magical weapons are listed, as well as the potential for cursed items to fall into the hands of the characters, introducing an additional danger element to the game, in addition to the monsters, the traps, and the tricks that may also lead to a premature PC death. It's important to note here that no identify spell is in this game. The only way to learn what the workings of a magic item were were by the brutish trial and error method or cough up some healthy coin and dedicate some time to finding a knowledgeable sage who could identify the history of the item and perhaps relay that to the characters and they would know exactly what they had uncovered. If there's one thing that modern D&D is missing is this element of danger and identify spell easily thwarts any cursed item and very rarely do player characters actually seek the services of a sage to identify some mundane plus one magical sword they've uncovered. However, to me, every magic item was created with a purpose and a reason and probably has some history behind it. Even the basic plus one magical axe, somehow it got into the treasure hoard of where it was found and that history could be interesting or integral to the campaign as any major artifact. Finally, part eight is the dungeon master information. This is where a prospective DM goes to find out about how to create their own setting, how to create the mysterious trap-filled dungeon the players will explore and run a game. There is also the Haunted Keep first level example with a very intriguing cutaway. The keep itself was once the castle of the Rodimus family and has long since been abandoned due to the family's mysterious disappearance. Rumors of it being haunted with strange lights and sounds coming from the place seen by passers-by. A group of goblins raiding the countryside have taken up residence in the place, and the beginning texts suggest that recent prisoners taken by the goblins are relatives of the PCs, thus giving them a reason to go investigate the place. The room descriptions have the DM rolling randomly to determine much of the contents of the dungeon's treasures, monsters, and traps with a room-by-room -room description given of this process taking place before actual play begins using the various random charts provided. This is a functional first adventure and one that I'm sure a lot of players had fun with back in the day, but for me personally, I don't find it a fraction as compelling for me as the Tower of Xenopus did in the home's basic set. Adventure-wise, the real star of the show here is the full module Keep on the Borderlands, which I'll discuss in a moment. However, I do find the sample dungeon expedition to be quite classic with Morgan Ironwolf the Fighter, Silverleaf the Elf, Frederick the Dwarf, Sister Rebecca, and Black Dougal the Thief going out to explore the aforementioned Haunted Keep. I especially love how poor Black Dougal misses the poison needle trap and dies after failing his saving throw. The rest of the party is just like, okay, everyone, we need to be more careful, and moves on. Great stuff. The final pages of the rulebook are dedicated to a discussion on being a good DM, including describing the monsters to the players, division of treasure, guidelines for advancement, and so on. There is also a pretty comprehensive glossary of terms at the end of the book as well, something that I feel newer editions of the game would do well to include. 
In addition to a full set of polyhedral dice, the Maldve basic box set also came with Keep on the Borderlands, which itself was an excellent teaching module written by the bard himself, Gary Gygax. As such, Keep on the Borderlands is one of the most played modules in RPG history. I also did a very popular video on that as well, so please check it out. But briefly, the eponymous Keep situated on the outskirts of civilization was the last bastion of safety, beyond which was an untamed chaotic wilderness simmering with danger and chaos. Not far off, a well-traveled road, a mere few miles from the Keep, was the Caves of Chaos a cavalcade of humanoid monsters lairing in a nearby cave network, and this was the first foray into dungeon adventure for many D&D players, including myself. The artwork for this edition are by many TSR Classic artists, such as Jeff D., Dave LaForce, Jim Rosliff, and Bill Willingham. There are also several interior pieces by Earl Otis, as well as the iconic cover with magenta cave walls, a sorceress and a dwarf encountering some type of dungeon lake dragon, which sadly doesn't appear in the rules, but I suspect many DMs made stats for it. Many of these are iconic art pieces, and while much of the interior art is certainly lacking in technical skill, they definitely invoke the feelings that playing the game was supposed to do, and that invokes certain nostalgia. Getting this at auction gets more and more expensive every year with good quality box sets running close to $100 based on quality and completeness. Though if you're patient, you can sometimes come away with a great deal. drive through RPG's PDF on this edition is really quite good. It's a great scan and I have it myself. It is available for only $4.99 for the PDF, but unfortunately it's not yet available for print on demand, which is a real shame. I'm not going to do a D20 review on this rule set as I don't feel that is really appropriate, though I might do something else at the end of the expert set review. However, I'll voice my personal opinion here. In 1983, BASIC was revamped again with a tutorial style, which I've covered in great detail in another video. There are a lot of positives to the tutorial style of Menser BASIC organization directly related to introducing the game to new players. However, once that introduction is complete, the book then serves as a reference work during actual game play. Maldve's approach is quite good. The rules are very clean and the game is very approachable. With the expert set, it's very much a complete game. Anyway, that's about all for now. In part two, I'll continue my retrospective with the expert set, my evaluation and final thoughts as to why this set has held up over the decades and in such high regard. But in addition to that, I'll show you how you can get a great quality print on demand copy for these titles. I'll also discuss which OSR rule sets I think are best if you're interested in this classic version of Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this retrospective review useful and helpful. As usual, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to all of my Patreons. Your support during the COVID crisis is greatly needed and I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this review, please subscribe and click the little bell so you'll get updates when I add new content. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a Patreon yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar. A link is in the description. As always, my friends, may your d20 roll true, and game on.